It's very great thing I ever met. I'm, I will devote the rest of my life for it. Thank you. Oh my God, you're Same question. Yeah. Eric, must, we just started Facebook Live, so if you can repeat the question. For, okay. Yeah. Question is, please tell us story of how you discovered cryptocurrency and how it's changed your life without using word that we already said you cannot use, which I will say for Facebook Live, word is the. I'm not gonna be able to do that, but uh, <laughs> I did the whole intro. I also, uh, I think you you also included uh, earlier how it related to the com companies that we're building, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and the and how we got into into those those businesses. Um, I mean, the very first time I ever saw Bitcoin was early, I think, 2010 or 11 or something. Like it, it was going around, uh, and like many other people at the time, I was like, okay, hey, this is. Cool, this is cute, yet yeah, this is yet another cryptocurrency. You know, what is so different about this one? How is this one gonna work? And um, you know, remember mining some Bitcoin and like you know, forgetting about it. The second time I really dove into it was around 2013, 2012, 2012, 2013, um, in relation to IPFS, because uh, I was already working on, on IPFS tech and what eventually became IPFS, which was uh, at the time just distributed data set package management. Um, and it seemed like, because of its recent success, it seemed like we were going to get a tipping point, and finally we we're going to get cryptocurrency. So cryptocurrencies have been around for a, quite a while in theory and some practical implementations, but never quite to this degree. Uh, and there was the idea of like, oh, what if we could use Bitcoin to to uh, incent the distribution of content on IPFS, and so like that yielded the beginnings of the Falcon, what eventually became the Falcon project. Um, what uh, without like going too much into a lot of the details, uh, IPFS and protocol apps and Falcon are, are, not, are not necessarily you know dependent upon the, the blockchain worlds. Uh, it happened to be a really good marriage at the time, um, and we are thinking of a whole bunch of problems that are that are separate and different from, from the one that blockchains solve. But but for us, blockchains happen to to enable the creation of open networks that, that create open services. So I'll be talking tomorrow about this, but more then, but what it enable, enables you to do is to create um, a useful service similar to the one provided by a utility or a company or something like that, and and to make the governance and maintenance of such a system uh, be maintained through programs. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff that, that I'm not talking about this now because other people will cover it and so on. All of the financial industry improvements, uh, dropping the transactions of legal, the, dropping the cost of legal transactions and so on. Like all, all the smart contract power is amazing. Um, but you can use that as a tool to create these networks uh, to build open services and, and markets. So you can create like these, these programmable markets where you can take existing resources and turn them into, into real commodities <coughs> and make much more open environments with lower the barriers to entry for a lot of participants. Um, and so it, uh, in a big way, the blockchain ecosystem has been able to open up a channel of innovation for a lot of the old ideas that were already written about and thought about and so on, but were just kind of theorized and, and hadn't really managed to gain enough momentum to become real implementations and real systems. So the success of Bitcoin and then the further interest in blockchain tech, which then turned into a whole bunch of other systems, things like Ethereum and so on, and that just kind of fed on, on itself, um, has you know, opened up a torrent of uh, of innovation that you know both old ideas resurging and, and, and finally becoming reality, and in a lot of cases a bunch of new stuff, right? So, so uh, these days we have the the you know the return of a bunch of ideas that didn't work out in the past, and a bunch of new new creations, and then the remixing of these things and so on. So the the what it has enabled us to do though is to, instead of us as a business, having to go and create a business model where we either 
give you something for free and create an advertising model, and then we basically take your data and treat you as a product and sell it to, to some advertisers, or charging you and hoping that you're going to be able to, are not going to like go into that free competitor that's going to do that, and instead of going to choose to charge to pay us uh, or you know, have some like contractual relationship, it has enabled us to, to instead offer a different deal. The deal here is we're going to build a network, and it's going to have a market. Uh, for some of you, it'll offer potentially profits when you, if you provide a useful, valuable service to the network. Think of it kind of like the Airbnb model. Um, and for some of you as clients, it'll give you, provide you a service, but you're paying the network and you're paying providers. You, you don't have to interact with us at all. Right? Like we, we're going to create a utility, like something that we treat as a public utility run by a whole network, run by a lot of participants that we don't control. And like that, that possibility is substantially very different. And, and it enables the creation of important infrastructure in the world um, that doesn't depend on, on, yeah, on, on us as an entity, as a business entity, maintaining that. So it's been really freeing as a creator of technology and so on from like the old trappings of what you had to do, like the contortions you had to do to build a business as a service on top of the tech you wanted to build. And it allows us to just think more about the protocols themselves <coughs> And focus on writing the protocols and building the protocols and creating a business associated with the protocol itself, as opposed to to you know trying to sell you something like five stacks higher. Um, and you know personally, I think uh, it's a it's a pretty crazy time. Like I, I think something that you all should consider, and, and I'll be interested to hear all your questions. At, you know, first at some point, like we should open up for hear your questions. Um, it's a pretty interesting time. The probably the price of Bitcoin and the price of Ethereum and on all these things. I've created a ton of hype, and so a lot of people are, are flooding into the space. Um, you know, th those things will attract people that are going to be here to stay for the tech, and some people will kind of just come while the price is high and then leave when it's not. Um, I urge you to think carefully about the tech, because what's going on here in these systems is laying the foundation and the groundwork for what's going to run a ton of important services in the future. This is a moment similar to the web moment, where there was this brave new world, there's a whole bunch of new things, the old industries kind of ridiculed it for a long time, didn't think it was going to be anything. Um, it was quirky and weird enough that it just got completely discarded, or like, you know, dismissed. Um, and it has managed to get enough momentum and some early successes to the point where now people are getting it, now people are maneuvering into it, but now that it has like got the pendulum has swung the other way and now there's a bunch of hype. Uh, and so, so it's important to like remember that like, though there's hype and there's a bunch of things that are not going to like, be accurate. There is a bunch of real value there. Right? Like, a, you know, remember that Amazon and other organizations like that got built during the height of, of the late '90s bubble. Um, and try as hard as you can to like just go back to real value and like, you know, cue calm and like build a spaceship. Like, don't worry about like this this nonsense asset bubble and like put that in the back of your mind and think of like a, the tech that's getting built, the value creation that's going on, and and, and help. Other, you know, either do it in your own projects or help other people realize that value, because we're like a, yeah, the, the tech that's being used right now and played with right now um, has has amazing equalization potential. Right? Like you, you, you're able to create a bunch of open markets, remove a bunch of middle middle uh, middleman entities from from financial systems, from from infrastructure systems, and so on, and build in services that immediately are international. You know, immediately cross all sorts of boundaries and, and jurisdictions, and, and a lot of people around the world can gain access to these services without having to to have any of the traditional trappings or, or, or requirements of a, of a of a jurisdiction, right? So, so it's kind of weird to think about this, but imagine being able to, to rent computing storage, like you know, data storage on the network today. Um, you you would have to have a credit card or a bank account or be a, an entity in a country registered with a government. To be able to like have the financial instruments necessary to hire storage for my company—that's crazy. Why, why do we need that? A lot of people in the world don't even have that. First of all, like, a lot of people in the world don't have bank accounts. And second, a lot of people, or, or a lot of systems, won't be people. A lot of systems will be programs hiring storage. So, so that's a kind of like way of thinking that you should be looking at a lot of these things through. And just removing barriers uh, of entry for for participants or innovation and so on. And and I would say like, you know, think about that and think about your own journey through it and you know, ask some questions later. Sorry, I took up way too much time. That's fine. Uh, I don't have as much to say, but no. Um, yeah, I, I first learned about um, 
you know, Bitcoin, I happened to live with a group of guys that were um, actually kicking off the College Crypto Network, which MIT Bitcoin Club had a big uh, part in that uh, ended up becoming the Blockchain Education Network. Um, and they kind of introduced me uh, to Bitcoin at the time. Um, I was excited about it, I wanted to build on it, um, but got very frustrated with uh, the debates going on and the lack of ability to build on it. And um, that kind of changed when Ethereum started to, to mature. And um, that's kind of when I, I really got excited about the space, because these guys had been talking about decentralized land registries and escrow contracts and stuff all around Bitcoin. Uh, but, you know, we weren't seeing any of that stuff happen. And, you know, when Ethereum, you know, really is, when you could actually start to build on that, um, that that's when you, you can see that, you know, this was, this was going to really happen. And, and that's, um, you know, when I, I tar started to take a serious interest in this stuff. And, um, that, that turned into starting uh, the Boston Ethereum developers and then um, meeting my co-founders and got uh, Level K going. Okay, <coughs> so, uh, so, so I, I got a little very long. So it started with uh, the rise and rise of Bitcoin. I don't know how many people saw that uh, movie. Uh, the rise and rise of Bitcoin. You should, you should watch it. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great movie in 2014. I was taking a microeconomics class and uh, I, the second day I went to the professor, I told her about, did you hear about Bitcoin? She said no, I told her it's a, it's a cryptocurrency, limited supply. Uh, she was like, the price is going to go way up, but the volatility will be really high. I didn't understand what volatility means, so I had to Google that. Uh, and I did go about that. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I can take that. Uh, so it started with uh, Bitcoin and then uh, 2016, uh, Ethereum, and then uh, Zcash, Filecoin. I got fascinated uh, about IPFS uh, because I came from Egypt originally, where in 2011, the government, I was here uh, in, uh, in the United States, and for a couple of days, they shut down everything, connections, no internet, nobody can talk to anyone. It was very worried. I have to take I had to take a flight from Pittsburgh to uh, New York to protest at the United Nations that they uh, press on Mubarak to open up the network so that we make sure that our family are okay. So as soon as I saw IPFS, uh, I was like, okay, it makes perfect sense. We should invest in that. So I was lucky enough to invest in Parkman. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons we believe in, in, in the blockchain, uh, 15 years ago, uh, I was working as a freelancer uh, from Egypt. And uh, the way you work is, uh, first of all, you pay 20 to 30% out, out of your work uh, to the platform, and then they tell you you have to work for a couple of months, make X amount of dollars, let's say $200, before you can take any of your own money uh, back. And then PayPal takes a cut. Your bank in your home country takes another cut. You end up getting 40 to 50%. But right now, we see a lot of projects uh, that they are building on top of IPFS, that they are cutting all the middlemen. So for example, uh, a person like me, I can live in Egypt for $5 a day. I can have an okay life, not a, I'm not gonna tell you a good life, but an okay life. So that's a great use case. And that's why we believe that uh, there will be a lot of use cases, uh, and it's actually happening now. One of them is, for example, IPFS in, in Turkey, uh, where they, you cannot access Wikipedia. Right? But you can access Wikipedia through IPFS. So that's a use case that nobody talks about it. Uh, so we believe as, as, as a fund that the blockchain adoption or product market value, it's not gonna come from developed countries. It's gonna come from developing countries. There's four billion people. They don't have access to the infrastructure that we have access uh, here in the States. 
So if you're building something, just think about outside of the US. Because in the US, right now, every, we're not in back in 2008 where uh, you hustle for uh, and use Groupon and everything that you buy. Right now, pretty much we all live a great life. Uh, but there, they care about sense. It makes a big difference. So if you can provide them products that you don't have access to banks, you don't have access to connectivity, uh, and that, that's what we see, okay, yeah, it makes sense that the product market fit for blockchain and adoption is gonna come from uh, de uh, developing countries. Uh, and, and we try to hold uh, our portfolio companies uh, going to these countries uh, and growing their community uh, of developers. Um, so, yeah, that's. Uh, All right. I would like to open it up for questions. Um, I think we have all these people here today, and feel free to ask them what you want. I think that's the best part of panels like this is being able to talk to these people directly. So, let's just start taking some questions. Yes. Um, to maybe this is maybe you two in the middle have a little bit of better answer for this, but how would you describe, I don't know, know this necessarily applies to you, um, but the kind of people, or the, like you know, the people, the younger um, people who got into Bitcoin or Ethereum. But I think, I think it's applied maybe more to Ethereum. Um, <coughs> and by association, all the, the ICOs that have come after it, but like a founder who started a coin um, and you know, all of a sudden is worth millions. Um, maybe from first or second hand experience, how, can you describe what that's like um, for to find more to find motivation to like see the project through? Because I see you know it being a huge problem that all these people are starting projects and then you know the the value skyrockets and like they have no incentive to to I mean. They have no financial incentive to continue the project. So, where does that leave them, and like you know, the the, the viability of, of the long term project? Like, like is it, you know, what's your experience? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So, um, I think our case is probably a bit different than most of the people starting those projects because Falcon was a second project. IPFS is our, it was like a main flagship product for, so it, and that is, it's a system project to Falcon, and it doesn't capture value, it just generates, it just creates value for other people, and we as a group were already very heavily motivated to see IPFS and Falcon through, simply because of IPFS and the users of IPFS. So as a team, we are super heavily motivated to like upgrade the whole stack from that perspective. And so we don't have that problem. Like we don't have the problem that a lot of other groups have, where suddenly they created something and it's potentially worth a lot, and so on, and they can like uh, clear out, right? So, oh, the other thing is with Filecoin, Filecoin is not liquid right now. Right? Like Filecoin is a we sold to investors a promise of a future token through a SAFT uh, specific agreement. To it's an investment contract to build the network and eventually deliver it, and then both the investors and, and we are vested for quite a long time. So ProPass is vested for six years. Like we're like linearly releasing our tokens. Um, so unlike some of these other groups that create a to token, raise a whole bunch of money, it immediately becomes liquid, and then they can sell it with no restriction. What the hell is that, right? Like, and I mean, people are investing in these things and they shouldn't. I mean, even Ethereum didn't do that. Ethereum was not immediately liquid, right? Ethereum was, a, you, you gave that you, you bought it ether at the beginning you know, the initial funding event they then went and built for a year and a half or I mean, the better part of a year I think a year and a half and then they then released the network and for a long time it was you know hovering around a dollar and a lot of the ethereum devs you know built continued to build for about a year now I think you're starting to see some of the effects that ethereum did not have vesting and a lot of people that were very instrumental to ethereum in the beginning maybe right now don't have a lot of incentive to, to keep going. But I actually don't think the majority of people that were working on, on Ethereum or the people that are working on Popcoin are money motivated. Um, if, if we were motivated, money motivated, we'd be doing things very differently and we'd probably be working on other projects. We're very like, 
infrastructure motivated. Um, and I think, I, I don't know if this extends to the whole, say, Ethereum team, but I think, like, a, from my experience, a huge fraction of the people building Ethereum are like that. They're just motivated on the tech and for, for the tech's uh, <coughs> creation, and so they're very motivated, <coughs> motivated to continue. I don't think that's the case about a lot of the other tokens that have been built. Like, what you get is, again, the, the, the what happened in the, in the 90s where a lot of people saw, you know, there were a lot of important technology companies built in the 90s that, that created a lot of value. And then suddenly there was an opportunity to get, to create something like that or the trappings of something like that. Uh, go public immediately, right? Like there was this, this <coughs> joke at the time that people would like start an idea and go public like the same day, right? Like it, it was not like that, but you know, that was like the, the joke at the time, which is very similar to, to what ICOs are, are, are doing. Um, but that's only a fraction, right? So I think, I think the important thing here is remember that like, there is a lot of noise, and that's a subset of the activity. That is not all of the activity. There's a lot of important tech projects being built. And you use, you'll usually be able to detect these by understanding what are those teams doing. Are they vesting? Are they immediately becoming liquid? Are they clearing out a bunch of money? Like, that's, you know, run those, run those questions. What were they doing before? And so on. There's actually great research coming out of MIT. Uh, uh, Christian Catalini, I think, has a really good research that shows this. I think he's going to give a talk about this tomorrow that talks about um, distinguishing between these projects. So I think, like, for the people building technology, the motivation is not the money. The motivation is the tech. At least that's for our kids. I was going to say, um, along the same lines, you know, you see two kinds of people. Uh, there's plenty of the people that are coming out, do their ICO, they're focused on marketing. Um, they are money motivated and there's the other kind of person that, you know, a lot of these people have already become very rich, you know, whether they invested in Ethereum or Bitcoin really early on, they've been in the space a while, but they are really passionate about the tech and, and they, that's, that's what's driving them forward. Um, and, and I think ultimately it's gonna be those types of founders and uh, team members that are, are ultimately gonna be uh, successful because, you know, a lot of these people might might get their money, but their project's not going to go anywhere if, if they, you know, aren't going to do anything with it. And um, you know, I, I, it it is refreshing to see how many people um, are in this space for the right reasons and are you know really in it to, to push the deck. Yeah, I guess it's like follow up and slash kind of open comment. I just realized the point that, that you made, where I just realized. There is no easy way to look at these projects and know what the vesting system is like. Like I don't know which one is a pump and dump and which one's not. But like that should be you know, if that information, if anyone wants to build that, if that information was more readily available, would that, that would be like maybe in the smart contract. They or? usually tell it to you. So so we set we put it down in our so we have this primer that talked about the business case for Popcorn mm -hmm. for investors that were gonna invest in the platform. Uh, and we talked about it right there, and we said, hey, here's the vesting schedule. Here's our vesting schedule, here's your vesting schedule. If you're an investor, you're gonna have this. Because you also want investors to vest, because what you don't want is people flipping. Or like, what you don't, you, you don't want a bunch of people to like, invest in something, and then dump it, right? Like, if, you, if you're getting investors, they should be with you to build a technology, not to just dump it on other people. And, and like, that's your, the hallmark yeah. of, a, of a bad project. Is, is your investing, because like, there's, I guess, you could be vesting uh, on a system that is uh, enforceable by law or enforceable by just you know contract. Like it'll, the transaction will just time it's time locked. So is that are there both types of that? Or? So there are both or types of that. Uh, in our case, we we explored both both options. We did it with a standard contract right. based on a whole bunch of legal advice. Yeah. Uh, we hope that in the future that is going to be completely automated through smart contracts. Some projects are already doing that. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, this will just become standard. Uh, yeah, and we're we're actually working on um, my team for the hackathon is working on a token curated registry of projects that meet um, certain criteria of like transparency and uh, token investing, and there's built in <coughs> incentives for um, discovering you know what what teams are doing this and what teams aren't, and, and really uh, sorting them out so that um, you know naive investors can come in and, and trust this mm -hmm. list. Okay, we have room for one more question. So yeah. um, you guys have talked about the blockchain application for developing countries. Can you talk about specific examples that you know blockchain has been used for 
of a project uh, for the developing countries and that has already made some difference. So I, I can speak to IPFS, but that's not a blockchain tech. And, like, I mean, you said hash chain, similar to how blockchains are hash chains. Um, so IPFS has been used by a number of groups. Um, in it, the two examples that, that, uh, that were mentioned were, one of them was uh, Turkey, and, um, and another one that I, so, so in the Turkey example, Wikipedia got blocked by Turkey. And so uh, there was a static dump of Wikipedia made and put on IPFS, so then people can, can browse that through, through IPFS and, and circumvent the blocking. Um, there, is, there was a similar case in Catalonia with the, the censorship of the vote. So if you remember, the, the, um, there was a, a effectively rogue um, election or a referendum to, to decide whether or not Catalonia should declare independence. And, uh, and the Spanish government censored that. And, 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 and in, a, in a manner where, you know, it was kind of weird to see a Western government that, you know, theoretically, you know, places a lot of value in things like freedom of speech and so on, uh, go to such extreme measures to, to censor people being able to vote and express themselves. Um, and at the time, people that were working on the Catalonia thing uh, used IPFS to distribute the polling stations and distribute the information that was censored. Uh, so that's another example. That's not quite the de developing world. It depends on how you, how you consider the economy of Spain and so on. Um, the, I, I, Spanish people would be really angry if they, they, <laughs> if they were considered their own country or whatever. Uh, they, uh, I think that the, the, there are a lot of other examples. One, some of the stuff that we care about is offline applications. So if, if you think of, of developing networks, so, so think of like a, the internet access in developing nations, um, the latencies and, and the bandwidth limitations are horrible there. And so the majority of the web doesn't work. Websites that have a lot of round trips and expect certain latencies and so on will just not function. And so in those cases, the tools that we're building allow the content to be moved into those areas. And once it's moved into those areas, it can be served locally. Like it doesn't have to, you, you never have to go uh, out. And so like that's, that's the different kind of, kind of thing. And now that's not blockchain, that's, that's IPFS. Um, we know of a bunch of other interesting blockchain use cases. Like I think there was a, um, I think done with refugees, uh, in, in like during the ref, or now it's still ongoing, like the refugee migration into, into Europe, uh, there's people trying to, to attach, give people financial services and identity services uh, through Ethereum. And, and I don't know that much about those projects, but I know that they exist. And I know that people like, actually gave, basically airdropped a lot of money to, to people through, through this. I, I don't know the specifics though, and I, and I can't cite it as, a, as like a, I definitely know that this was great. Uh, that's, that's what, those are some examples. Yeah, just adding to one, uh, I, I don't want to just promote any project. Uh, so I'll give you an example. There's a project that's uh, trying to do Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, that's, that's a use case. <coughs> they are just cutting uh, Amazon uh, fees. Then you, you, can get, you can do the, the whole work and you, you get 100%. Uh, so that's another project. I don't want to promote uh, projects, so that's not our use case. All right, I think I'm going to have to stop it there. Everyone, thank our speakers for coming. Thanks, guys, for being here. Thank you. Can I respond to the question of two of them? Yeah, of course. Uh, I think um, they raise a lot of money, um, but I think <coughs> there are many, many projects where it goes nothing in the end. Only a few will succeed. Why? Because uh, the, the, um, the project is a whole new thing. You need to use whole new thinking, way of thinking. Uh, because you need to be distributed. And for example, uh, the Fusion, our core team, about 10, only get 3%. And many, we, we we choose selected supporters, select, select uh, um, advisors, and select uh, investors. Most of them 
only get uh, get dozens of ETH. They want to uh, invest a thousand, only get, give less than one hundred. Why? Needs to be distributed. Need many resources to make things happen. We sell ideas. We tell them there is a way to make human life much better. This is ideal. We have have proof of concept, and you will buy this idea, okay? Because this is a good thing for the whole whole home home kind. And then we will create a non-profit foundation. And this non-profit foundation will do all the rest job. And this non-profit foundation's product is community. Because this project belongs to nobody. This belongs to the whole community. And foundation is a centralized organization. And found what foundation do was to help all these people to make things happen. So this is a totally different design. And, uh, and <coughs> for these successful projects, maybe uh, they will not happen in the uh, developed country because there are very strong centralized organizations. Banks, uh, government, and so the revolution began from this uh, verge, not in the central. That's what I think. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks all for coming. Get back to hacking. No, I can just keep it going forever. You